to destroy the works. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 19 through 20. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ. We now invite you to open your Bibles and your minds as we present the Gospel of Christ. And now, Ben Bailey. To encourage His disciples on the daily nature of Christianity, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke chapter 9, verse number 23. Welcome to our study of the book of James. James goes hand in hand with the words of Jesus, encouraging us to live daily for God because James is all about practical Christianity. Key verse in the book of James is James chapter 1, verse number 22. James says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What, what, what's the book of James all about? James is writing to Christians, some of whom are facing persecution, some of whom are no doubt struggling by the temptations, and he encourages them, don't just say it, do it. Be living your Christianity each and every day. James 1.27 compliments this idea and says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the widow's orphans in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's the idea, pure, undefiled Christianity. It's authentic, pure nature is what James is discussing as it relates to Christianity. And so key verse, James 1.22, and the key idea is to be doers of the word. Some have said that James and Proverbs go hand in hand in that they are each practical books about Christian living, about being faithful to God. James is all about getting our work boots on and getting to work in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the key words that you'll find in the book of James is the word faith. Faith will occur some 12 times and, and James will illustrate throughout the book that uh, true faith is not just saying that I believe in Jesus, it's not just claiming I recognize Him as the Son of God, Rather, it's doing, being a doer of the work. You've got to put your faith into action. Never in the Bible do we see that faith is just merely an acceptance of a fact. It's that trust that motivates us to live for God each and every day. You also find uh, the word works mentioned often in the book of James. In fact, it's mentioned 13 times in the book. Faith and works go hand in hand. They're not diametrically opposed. Because I believe in God, I do have faith in Him as the Almighty. As we think then about the first chapter in the book of James, James will illustrate these positive ideas about basic Christianity, beginning with where some of these Christians might be. Some of them are indeed facing trials. Some of them have come out of Judaism, others maybe have come out of paganism, and maybe there are temptations, maybe there are trials from their former life and temptations that they're dealing with. James writes to encourage us along the nature of those trials. I want you to notice James chapter 1, beginning in verse number 2. The scripture reads, My brethren, count it all joy, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's a fact that, that as Christians, we're going to have to face trials, but those trials, if we'll use them in the right way, can actually help us. Count it all joy. Paul said in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, after he had been stoned and left for dead, he arose and said, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. And later he would say in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How is it that we can face this persecution and these trials? We face it in view of the great example 
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 is a context about the, the suffering of Jesus, how that He didn't revile, He didn't come back with some kind of antagonistic remark, but rather He allowed Himself to suffer for the cause of Christ and thus were to follow in His footsteps. For to this were you also called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in His footsteps. And so James chapter 1 teaches us about being purified by the trials that we face. It shows us that as Christians, even in the midst of these trials, we need to praise God, the giver of all good gifts. Look at James chapter 1. What a, a beautiful thought about Almighty God. James says in James 1 verse 17, Every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there is no shadow or variation of turning. James is dealing with the fact that in the midst of this trial and tribulation and difficulty, someone might be prone to say, why is God letting this happen? And James says, whoa, now wait a minute. Let's not say why God let this happen. Let's look inward first and then let's look upward and let's realize God's the giver of every good and perfect gift. If we seek first the kingdom of God, Matthew 6 verse 33, Jesus said all these things, food, shelter, clothing, all these things will be provided for you. Do you remember the words of Psalm 37 verse 25? I was young and now I'm old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. David says that God's going to take care of. It's been a track record with God. You can write it down and mark it. God's going to take care of His own. Do you remember Philippians 4 verse 19? Paul said, and you can almost hear the overtone of, of praising God, My God shall supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. And so instead of getting angry and saying, Why God let this happen? We can take our trials, learn from them, let them purify us, look at any changes that may need to be made in our life and praise God, the giver of all good gifts. But you know, pure religion also promotes more hearing and less speaking. Isn't that what James is going to say? Notice James chapter 1, verse number 19. The scripture records, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. James here, after encouraging us to take a minute and stop and praise God, then reminds us we need to do more hearing and less speaking. Oh, how true that is. As God's people, the Scripture tells us for every idle word we speak, we're going to give an account. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37. And thus, since God gave us two ears and one mouth, we ought to do twice as much listening and half as much speaking. Jesus said to the churches in Asia Minor, in Revelation 2 and 3, He would say in every one of those letters, to him that has ears to hear, let him hear. What's the point? God gave us ears for the reason of listening, for the purpose of listening and hearing. Let's do just that. Take heed how you hear. Luke 8, 18. Mark 4, verse 24. Take heed what you hear. And ultimately, we need to hear the Word of God, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. And then as we turn our attention to the latter part of the book of James, chapter 1, we find in verse 27 that the pure, authentic, practical Christianity is about helping and providing for the needy. I want you to notice again James chapter 1, verse number 27. Notice what the Scripture records here. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You take Christianity down to some of its most, most basic elements and what's it really all about? It's about helping the poor, doing good to those who are in need. Those who are sick, those who are hurting, those who are downtrodden, those who are hungry. Who ought to be helping those people? Christians with an eye towards saving their soul ought to be trying to help those people. Do you remember Galatians 6 verse 10? Do good unto all men, especially 
the household of faith. Does the Christian have the, the right and the responsibility to help others? You bet he does. Look at Jesus' example. He fed the poor. He, he helped those who were needy. He healed those who were sick, those who were bereaved and downtrodden. Jesus loved those people. He had compassion on them, and he strove every day to help them. Little wonder then is it that the Bible records in Mark chapter 12, verse 37, the common people heard him gladly. Who were those common people? Those who had been sick, those who had been poor, those who had been, he, Jesus had been there healing and helping them. And when Jesus spoke, they listened carefully at his words because they knew just how much the Savior loved and cared for them by his actions. Now, as we think about really breaking down some of the ideas in James chapter 1, there are four major words that kind of occur that, that help us to put our faith in God and really trust Him. The first word is the word count. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials. James chapter 1, verse number 2. J Notice James doesn't just assume that we'll experience some trials. He doesn't say if trials come, but when they come. They're going to come, count it a joy. Jesus taught us this. John 16, Jesus said, we'll have tribulation in the world. It's something that's going to happen in my life and yours. On a daily basis, we have difficulties and struggles that we have to deal with. There may be sickness. We live in a world where sickness, disease, and death do occur. There, there may be accidents, tragedies that happen. There may be in my life and yours disappointments, even death. I'm going to have to face that. How do I do it? Count. Count it what? Count it all joy when we come into those trials knowing God's going to be there with us as His child. Yes, Satan's going to oppose us. He's going to do what we can. But the Christian's response is to count it all joy. We need the attitude of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 5 verses 40, or excuse me, James in Acts chapter 5 verse 40 through 42, Peter and John there, they counted it a joy to be suffering for the cause of Christ. We need the example of Paul in our lives. Acts chapter 16 verse 25, Paul and Silas are in prison. There they're praying and singing praises to God and the prisoners were listening to them. You see, my friend, as we think about trials, this is one of the things that makes a Christian stand out. Do you remember 1 Peter 4, verse 16? If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him praise God in that name. And so, what's my first response to difficulties that may come? First, I want to remember, count it a joy, that I am privileged to suffer, to face difficulties on behalf of Christ, who did so much for me. Do you remember Hebrews 12, verse 1? The writer takes our attention away from that great cloud of witnesses who is cheering us on, and he now tells us to do this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God in view of everything Christ did for me. The fact that he went to the cross, counting it a joy to suffer, I need to count it a joy as well to suffer and face those trials which will help me to grow spiritually and bring honor to the name of God. Second word that we need to remember in James chapter 1 is the word know. Notice James chapter 1 verse number 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. I need to know that as I'm tried, as I'm tested, as I face difficulties, that that's what's going to make me stronger as a Christian. Is God doing this to, to bring His justice? That's not what we're trying to say. And that's not what James is saying. Rather, know that these things will work out for your benefit if you remain true to God. 1 Peter 1, 7. They try us and we can come out of the fire like gold that's been refined. Just as a training that an athlete may have to go through. If you're running a marathon, the training you face for, that's not easy. Friend, that training is what makes it possible for you to win the race. As God's children, with the understanding that we have joy in trials, let's also realize that God is working for us in so many ways that we may not even realize. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good 
to those who love the Lord. The Bible clearly teaches in the midst of these trials, we can cast all our cares upon Him. God cares for us and God makes it possible for us to bear up under these trials by our faith, the faith we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Third word then, as we face these trials, first I count it all joy. Then I know that it'll help my faith. And then, James chapter 1, verse 4, let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I have to let. That is, I have to allow these trials, these difficulties, and the things I face to work in me and through me for the betterment of me spiritually and to the praise of God, to truly turn trials into triumph. You've got to let patience do its work. Too often, we want to get our trials over quickly. Too often we think to ourselves, oh, I wish I could get this over. And, and no doubt that's a natural feeling. But when patience has the opportunity to work, oh, it produces spiritual maturity in the child of God. You know, when you think about spiritual maturity, it is that difficulty that we face that makes us stronger as a child of God and helps us to grow in Christ. You know, as we think about the growth process, Someone may start out as a babe in Christ. And that babe in Christ is going to have some challenges and difficulties. But if he'll stay true, stay faithful, be faithful unto death, Revelation 2 verse 10, if you keep studying, keep praying, keep trusting in God, as you endure those, the things that you face will indeed make your faith in God grow stronger every day. Now that fourth word, not only do I count, not only do I know, not only do I let patience have its perfect work, but then the Bible says as Christians, we need to ask. Let him ask of God. How do you deal with trials? Prayer helps us so much to deal with our trials. Notice James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. How do we deal with our trials? Let him ask of God. If any of you lacks wisdom, and friend, it takes wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply God's truth to everyday life. Proverbs 1 verse 7, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And so wisdom is something I need to deal with these trials. How do I get that? Let him ask of God. Oh, we need God's help in dealing with our struggles. God has promised to give it to us and not just to give it to us, to give it to us liberally. He will give it to us liberally. Let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given unto him. You know, when I think about Solomon, one of the great events in his life, God said to Solomon, as he's about to take over as king, ask whatever you wish, I'll give it to you. Could have asked for money, could have asked for the lives of his enemies, could have asked for a host of various things. What did he ask for? Wisdom, the ability to discern, to judge between God's people and right and wrong. As Christians, that's what we need, the ability to not only know the Word, but to apply it to our lives in everyday practical situations so that we can grow closer to God and live more faithfully to Him each and every day. Now, as you think about James and, and the practical nature of Christianity, James is going to teach us some things about being doers of the Word that really apply, apply right to the heart of what we need to do to be faithful unto the Lord and live for Him. And especially, we want to notice some things in the latter part of the chapter that, that teach us how to trust in God and live for Him. And one of those, first of all, is you've got to have the right heart condition. You know, Christianity is a lot about my heart and motive. That's not all it is. There's no doubt. You've got to have action, and James will stress that. But friends, if you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then that's a heart condition. That's a, a mindset. That's the way we think and act in this life. James tells us that we've got to have the right heart condition if we're truly going to be doers of the Word. What's that mean? You've got to be quick to learn. The Bible says, let every man be swift to hear. 
You know, when we think about as Christians being doers of the Word, the first thing you've got to do to be a doer of the Word is hear the Word. You've got to find out what the Word says. I love the example of Luke chapter 11, verse 1. The disciples came and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Oh, there's the right heart condition. Quick to learn. Lord, teach us. That's the mindset we need. We don't, we're not know-it-alls. We don't have all the answers, but you know what? God's Word does. John chapter 6 and verse 45, there we again see the idea of Jesus teaching His disciples. Acts chapter 8, verse 30 and 31. Uh, here's the example of Philip, uh, an Ethiopian eunuch. He comes up to him, understand what you're reading. How can I unless some man teach me? That's the attitude. That's the mindset as children of God that we need. You know, sometimes we have the mindset opposite of what Paul had. Paul said, not that I've already attained or am already perfected. I press on toward the prize that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. Think about those words. Paul said, I'm not there yet. I've not attained it. I've not reached perfection. Paul could still grow and learn as a child of God. And I've got to do the same thing. But you know, to be quick to hear... This also means that we're ready to be taught. That's an acquired trait, no doubt. We've got to have the mindset that I want to learn, I want to be taught of God. I love the example of Acts 17, 11. The Bible says of the Bereans, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they, searched the, they, they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. What's it mean they received it with all readiness? They were ready to learn. They wanted to be taught. They wanted to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And friend, that's part of the heart condition of being a doer of the Word. Are we quick to hear? Are we ready to learn what God wants us to learn from His Word? 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Acts chapter 18, verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila pulled Apollos aside, they taught him more perfectly the way of the Lord. And he was willing to hear, he was willing to be taught as well. The example of Paul stands at the top of this list. Acts chapter 9, Saul is confronted with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Lord, what would you have me to do? That's the mindset. That's the attitude one needs to be quick to hear the Word and the will of our God. But you know, as it relates to being doers of the Word, we also need to be slow to speak. Too many times when we hear something, when something happens, when someone says to us, isn't the natural inclination to say something back? Well, the child of God has to learn to control that to slow down, to think about what he's going to say. Proverbs 10, 19, Proverbs 17, 27, both of those passages will teach us the need to be slow in what we say. I don't have to respond quickly. I need time to think about it sometimes. I need to, to listen and to slow down and to let God's Word take its place in my life so that I can do what God wants me to do. And then, of course, no doubt the proper heart condition is, I need to be slow to uncontrolled anger or wrath. Remember chapter 19, James 1, excuse me, verses 19 and 20. Every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Why? The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let's say that I hear something. Let's say something is said and I, I take the time to, to, to be quick to hear. I'm ready to hear. I slow down. That sinks in. And maybe it's different. Maybe it's something I've not heard. Maybe it's contrary to what I've been taught. Slow down, be quick to hear, and then don't get mad easy. Don't, if it's the Word of God, don't let it make you mad. If it's truth, don't let that truth upset you. Rather, have the heart condition that if this is from God, if this is what the Word of God says, even if it's something different, even if it's something I've never heard, if it's truth, I want to accept it. Not get angry, not get angry at God or others, but rather do what God says. This is why Paul would say in Galatians 4 verse 16, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You never become somebody's enemy by telling the truth and receiving the truth ought not to make us angry or upset at God in any way whatsoever. That's what God wants us to do in this life, to live for Him each and every day. And so as we think about practical Christianity, as we think about what it really means 
to live for Jesus every day. Friend, you've got to take the Word and do it. You've got to live this book each and every day in your life. That's what a Christian is all about. My life and your life, it's no longer about us. Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Galatians 2 verse 20. He later said, we're living sacrifices. Romans 12 verse 1, we've been bought at a price, our body and our spirit now belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 19 and 20, and our aim, our motivation every day needs to be living faithfully for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are trials going to come? Yeah, they're going to come. But remember, and this is what makes Christianity so unique. Friend, Christianity stands out because even in the midst of our trials, we can have joy. How is that? God's going to be there to help us. These trials can make me stronger. Patience and wisdom will help me to deal with it. And if I can overcome my trials, the end result will be I'm stronger, I'm more faithful, and I'm more ready to endure the difficulties that I face in this life. I love James 1 verse 12. James says, of the trials that we face and the difficulties that we often have, that the one who endures... He'll receive the reward in the end of those trials. Now, friend, for this to be yours, for the things that we've talked about today to be in your life, you first have to be a Christian. Friend, we kindly ask you this morning, out of love and kindness today, we ask you, are you a child of God? Have you ever obeyed the gospel of Christ? Friend, we want nothing more in all the world than for you to become a New Testament Christian, nothing more, nothing less, just a child of God. God wants that. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth which can make men free. John 8 verse 32. He wants it so much that He sent His Son. John 3 16. God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Have you believed in Jesus? If you believe He's the Son of God, have you acted upon that? Are you willing to repent and change your life? Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Upon that repentance, are you willing to make the good confession? Romans 10 verse 10 says, With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And friend, would you do what Jesus said? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And if you've done those things, friend, our encouragement today is don't just be a hearer, be a doer of God's Word. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your work. And to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, and to God be the glory. This is the gospel of Christ.